In the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness had seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region of shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to talk to you today about the pastoral dimension of God's work of redemption. It's not just the theology of how God redeems us, but how that plays out practically in your life and mine. I tell you that because we're going to start with Zebulon and Naphtali. I know people, I know as we read the lessons, you did not think, man, I hope Father Mills gives us a history lesson on the geography of ancient Palestine, but I am, but I'm going to get somewhere important. We'll start with Zebulon and Naphtali. It's an interesting little area. It's the north of of Israel, around the Sea of Galilee. Zebulon and Naphtali are two of the sons of Jacob. As Jacob, who was renamed Israel, goes into slavery in Egypt, he takes all of his sons with him. Joseph has gone before him, but the rest of the family comes. And during the course of their slavery the people of God maintained their tribal allegiances, their family stories, their identity as belonging to one of the sons of Jacob. Yes, they would see themselves as Hebrews, as the people of God in exile, as having an identity as a nation. But within that group, they would remember the subset, the clan, the tribe to which they belong. Not just I am a Hebrew, but I belong to the tribe of Judah, to the tribe of Benjamin, to the tribe of Levi. You know what that's like. Sometimes we are Americans. Sometimes, kind of always, we are Texans, right? We get, you can belong to the big group and the smaller group. After the exile, after the exodus, after the wandering in the desert, and after the pacification of the land, some tribes settled in their territorial boundaries. Judah settled in the south. Benjamin with Judah there in the south. There were places for some of the sons of Joseph. But of the twelve tribes, seven could not be bothered. They lived wherever they lived. They never claimed the land. And so in the book of Judges, there is a scene where the people are gathered together and they take out a map and they draw regions and they draw lots. And wherever the lot falls, the tribe has to move. 
Good news for some, bad news for Zebulun and Naphtali. They get the north. The people of God lived in Israel in between great world powers, Egypt to the south and a variety of powers to the north, and the threat always came from the north. And so it was that when the Assyrians attacked Israel, they attacked Zebulun and Naphtali first. They were the border tribes of the whole country. When the Syrians came after them and attacked Israel, they attacked Zebulun and Naphtali. And in all the times that the people of God were conquered, it was Zebulun and Naphtali who fell first. You can imagine what that's like for them. You can imagine how the tribes to the south would say to them, why can't you control your own borders? Why can't you handle your land? Floods of invaders. In the gloom of the possibility of invasion and the shame of being conquered fell mostly on them. That's where they were in Isaiah's day. They had been carted off into slavery. And if you were a part of the tribe of Zebulun or part of the tribe of Naphtali, you carried with you the burdensome memory, the constant gloom, the shame of being the first to be conquered. That was, in a way, your identity. So when Isaiah says, the light will come up for people who have walked in deep darkness, in gloom, they knew it was them, the people who carried that burden. It was a little bit different in Jesus' day, but it was similar The people who lived there were first the Assyrians and then the Syrians. And then that part of the world was conquered again by the Greeks and again by the Romans so that it became a multicultural, multilingual, multi-faith area where Jews and Gentiles intermixed, at least in their social life. Nothing like the power of Jerusalem, nothing like the holiness of the temple, a border area of confused identity and always wondering who would conquer them next. When they look back, who they were was clear to them and it was not good news. We get that, don't we? Identity being formed by looking back Maybe it's because we are Southerners. Faulkner said, the world to a Southerner is like riding in the back of a pickup truck. You can't see what's ahead of you. Everything around you is a blur. But the past, what's already gone by, is especially clear to us. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's because it's easier. There are people now in Arlington trying to figure out how the Cowboys game is going to go. Tomorrow, Everybody will be an expert in football, right? After the fact, we feel like we understand it once it's gone and passed. It's easier to figure out who we are based on our past. It is also destructive, isn't it? I think about pastoral conversations I've had with people who have an identity focused on something that happened years ago. I think of a woman who was in my office at a different church struggling with the events that gave rise to her divorce. Her divorce over two decades before, but it still dominated her life and it dominated all of her relationships. Wrestling with this one thing constantly became not just something that happened to her, but the center of her identity. It became who she is, who she was. She had no way, no natural way, no easy way of breaking out of that. For those of you who have school children, especially school children at our school that goes through eighth grade, you know that we talk a lot about that as a dynamic. You live in a small town, 
and go to the same school all your life as I did, that silly thing you did in fifth grade can dominate your high school years. That's who you are. The great thing about Good Shepherd is we end at eighth grade. You get to go somewhere else, have a new identity, a fresh start, because we naturally form our identities by looking back. Not looking forward at possibilities, but looking back becomes who we are. It's the orientation to the past, the fixed identity of the past, that leads us to want God to do something about it. For God to somehow do a miracle, maybe, that would make the past different, or if we know that's not what God does, at least to come with a new identity so that we could be a different person. But the truth is, that's not how redemption works. It was the will of God that when the Son of God began His ministry, when the day spring began to preach the gospel, when the light of the world was manifest, it would happen not in Jerusalem, but in a place of deep gloom and heavy darkness. It would happen away from Jerusalem, not as a detriment, but in this case as a benefit. After the death of Herod the Great, the whole kingdom was divided into four different areas under four different sons. And when Herod, the son, captures John the Baptist and puts him in prison and will eventually kill him, it is to those parts that are not under Jerusalem's control, to the distant lands where Jesus flees, to a place that has both Jews and Gentiles, that is, multilingual and multicultural, where people live wanting a new day. And when he begins to preach, it is like the sun rising after a long and dark night. Jesus offers them something new, not despite their past, but growing out of it. The very thing of which they were ashamed, the consequences of their having been conquered, becomes the reason they are valuable to God. That's the way redemption works. When God redeems us, God does not take away the thing that burdens us, but transforms it. He does not change our past or cut us off from where we have been, but makes that the source of redemption. St. Augustine once said that in his own pastoral ministry he was sure that God would never allow an evil to exist unless God already knew how to bring good out of it, how to redeem it. What does that mean? It means that God does not cause the cancer, but Having borne it, having endured it, God has a way of using that experience to minister to people we would not otherwise reach. God does not cause the divorce, but having had that experience, God has a way of redeeming the negative parts of that experience and making it fit for His purposes. God does not cause the child to become rebellious or the business to fail, but having endured it, God has a way of making it glorious. There are numerous stories of people who go into medicine because of an experience of a childhood illness, who become lawyers because they have an experience of injustice, but for Bill A.'s acceptance that he was an alcoholic, he never would have been able to submit that to God, and we would not have the great work of Alcoholics Anonymous. God takes what we have, the negative parts of us, the thing we would wish God to take away, and makes that the point of glory. The question for us is not whether God can redeem it, but whether we are willing to let God redeem 
even that part of us. Whether in prayer, we will pray for God to take something away or to at least let us ignore it. Or if we will say to God, having endured this, having come this far, I surrender all. Whether we are willing to let the bad part of our past become a part of the good story that God is telling in Jesus. Because the promise is that when we hand those things to God, it is like a new day. Like light dawning in the valley of the shadow of death. Like new hope bursting out of the thing of which we were once afraid or ashamed or burdened. Upon that, upon us, it is like the dawn that is brought by the Son of God. Out of the deep darkness and the gloom of the shadow of death, Jesus, the new light, shines. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.